Good evening, and once again, welcome to our continuing study of ideas that formed us. Um, we'll continue with where we ended up, um, from where we ended up last week, but as always, let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Father, thank you for the opportunity to meet. Um, it would be wonderful if we could all gather together, but we are scattered um, across the eastern seaboard. Uh, I don't know where beyond that, but in any event, thank you for the technology that allows us to meet. Thank you for those who have an interest in understanding your word. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, let me turn the alarm off on my phone or the notification thingy. Um, tonight, last week, we um, ended up or finished up talking about Socrates. And of course, Socrates' famous student was a gen gentleman by the name of Plato. And we are going to um, talk a bit about him tonight. Uh, Plato was born in Athens in 428 BC. So he was a true Athenian. And um, he actually lived, uh, which seems to be in those days, at least the records that we have, he lived to be 80 years old, so he was quite um, an old fellow for his time when he passed away. And at 40, at the age of 40, he founded his school, which was called the Academy. Now, the Academy was called that, um, excuse me. The academy was called that not because academy meant school um, or place of learning or all smart people come here. Uh, it was called the academy simply because the land on which it was established was given by a benefactor um, named Academia. That was his name and he provided the land to Plato for the school. Um, but of course academy has come to mean much more than that um, since then. There was a sign over the door of the academy that said, let none but geometers enter in. Now, modern uh, folk would be led to believe that having a sign like that would mean that Plato was very interested in math, was primarily interested in mathematics which um, to a certain extent was true. His passion was philosophy, the search for truth, the search for ultimate reality. Um, but he was also very interested in mathematics. In fact, um, it is said that at a point in his life, uh, he, was, uh, he, went, he left Athens and he was uh, bound and was sold into slavery. And... Um, because of that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, he met the Pythagoreans. And of course, we recall from our study that the Pythagoreans uh, used mathematics to find their ultimate reality, or at least to search for it. Uh, and that's how Plato ran into them. So there's a connection, however, between geometry and philosophy. Both of those, mathematics, and philosophy are considered formal sciences. Now that does not mean that those who practice those mathematics and philosophy wear a tuxedo or have to um, dress extravagantly every day to work in their field. Formal means um, the search for the form or the essence of the thing, the thing that's being studied. Um, in this particular case, the form or essence, the form or essence of the universe or the ultimate reality. Um, Plato maintained a, key, uh, a, a keen interest in mathematics um, because of its concern with abstract ideas, which 
were basically um, the central or sent, they were central to Plato's thought. Um, Plato also, the, well, the core of his philosophy, his worldview, if you will, his um, description of reality was based on what, what he called a saving of the phenomena. Now, what does that mean? What was his description of phenomena? Phenomena refers to everything not, it does not mean the paranormal, um, what we have come to think of today as Bigfoot, or a phenomena could be um, aliens, not uh, from another country, but from another planet. The phenomena were all those things that we experience that manifest themselves to our senses. Um, and science is basically the explanation of reality. And by saving the phenomena, this is what he meant. You establish a paradigm based on the fitting together of the pieces that you have observed to a certain point. Look, look at it this way. The sum total of your experiences that you have drawn the, um, uh, as, as much of a conclusion out of as you can to form your view of the world. Picture that as a jigsaw puzzle. You put the puzzle together based on the pieces that you have gathered in your experience, and there's one piece left over. That's an anomaly. Okay, It doesn't fit in your puzzle or the construct of your puzzle, but one piece left over in the box is not enough for you to change your entire viewpoint. Okay, now let's say that your puzzle, as you put it together, there's 50 pieces left over in the box. Now this has to give you pause um, to rethink your puzzle or your paradigm because that many missing pieces or that many pieces left over that do not fit your paradigm would indicate that there's something wrong with your viewpoint something wrong with your outlook or your explanation of things. Par Plato's paradigm, his purpose in saving the phenomena, um, and again, what that means is saving the experiences, cataloging the experiences, remembering them and the um, conclusions that could be drawn from them as individual pieces of his particular puzzle. His paradigm was to relax the tension between Parmenides and Heraclitus. Do you remember what that was? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Parmenides, <clears throat> excuse me, um, believed that everything is being. It's fixed. It either is or it is not. Heraclitus said everything is a constant change or is changing or everything is in flux. Remember um, the example, you can't step in the same river twice because by the time you put the other foot in, the water has moved on and the river has changed. This is the tension being, and another way to put this, 
becoming. Heraclitus stated that all things are constantly in a stage of becoming. Parmenides, Parmenides says that that's not possible, that things are or they are not. So this was con constantly being discussed in Plato's time, and he wanted to resolve that conflict. Um, this could be the thesis. This can be the antithesis, meaning, obviously, the idea and the argument against that idea. You could flip those around. Plato wanted to come up with a synthesis to balance both, because both, in our experience, are real. Things are constantly changing, but things are as well. So that led him to come up with his theory of ideas. Um, the theory of ideas is really not what you may think that it is. Um, Interestingly enough, Plato was both a realist and an idealist, and they seem to be at odds with each other, but his idealism was with a capital I. Now, what do I mean by that? Basically, Plato believed that there were two different worlds. One, the real world, was the world of ideas. The other world, the physical world or material world, whichever um, word you choose to use to describe it, the material world, the world we actually live in, is not the real world but merely an echo of the real world of ideas. Now, what did he mean by that? The realm of ideas is the realm of true knowledge. And I think you'll, um, as we go along, you may, I hope, you'll come to see exactly what he meant and why he felt that way. The realm of material objects is merely opinion in Plato's mind. And what does that mean? Well, in the Republic, um, his, of course, it's still in libraries today. In his book, The Republic, he gives an example. And I'm going to read it to you in Plato's language. Plato tells an imaginary story of men who lived in a cave as prisoners since childhood. They are chained and they are immobile. Their field of vision is restricted to a wall directly in front of them. Behind them is an elevated area where people are constantly walking to and fro and carrying objects made of wood, stone, or other materials. The glow from a fire behind them casts shadows on the wall in front of the two prisoners. The, um, the prisoners hear the voices of those people and assume that the voices are coming from the shadow. Remember, they're immobile and cannot see the human beings behind them. They can only see the shadows. They have never seen real life. They have been in this cage, cave um, as prisoners since a very young, young age. So when they hear the voices and they see the shadows moving back and forth, they assume or believe that the shadows or the voices are coming from the shadows. 
Plato then asked what would happen if one of the prisoners were released and allowed to walk toward the fire. Having been cramped up for so many years, he would find, first of all, walking to be painful. The glowing fire would hurt his eyes because looking at real objects would be more painful than gazing at shadows in the soft light of the cave. He would be inclined to return to his customary position and confine his glance or his looking at the customary shadows. But suppose the prisoner were dragged out of the cave and into the midday sun. The pain in his eyes would be intense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Soon, however, his eyes, of course, would grow accustomed to the light and he could see things clearly. This would be an epiphany for him. What he could actually see, the reality of things. If, however, he were then forced to return to the cave and tried to explain his newfound knowledge to his fellow prisoner and his new understanding of reality, he'd be laughed at. If they could lay hands on the man who was trying to set them free and lead them up from the darkness to the light, they would kill him. I think there is a rather um, startling correlation to this um, with the way that Christ wanted to lead people from the darkness into the light and he was killed. But maybe, of course, Plato knew nothing about that. It hadn't happened yet, for one thing. But Plato may have been um, alluding to what happened to Socrates, his mentor. Oh, excuse me. Now, Plato, to him, knowledge from the material world, once again, is merely opinion. And what did he mean by that? Um, I can experience something, and on the surface, you can experience the same thing, but we draw completely different conclusions. In fact, we may say that the... Uh, the shirt was blue, and I would say the shirt was green. We can have all kinds of discrepancies from our experiences and our observations in the material world that we live in. It happens every day, does it not? But in the realm of ideas, uh, first of all, the task of educating people, unlike um, the, the sophist who didn't believe you could learn anything, um, the task of education is to lead people out of the darkness and into the light. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, the Latin term uh, where we get education from, educare, um, describes the process as being to lead out of. Um, at the root, the word ducare means to lead. Uh, Plato saw people living in two different worlds, the world of ideas and the world of physical objects. Now, here's the interesting thing and where he goes beyond this. Um, material and ideas are the two worlds. Um, he referred to material objects as receptacles. Not something that you plug a toaster into in the wall, if anybody uses those other than my wife and I anymore. Um, but receptacles 
things that receive or contain something else. Uh, let me, I'll get to the, what that really means in just a minute or how he meant it. Um, the form causes the essence of the thing. In other words, the form, <laughs> I know that's pathetic. The form of a chair, that's a chair, believe it or not, um, contains the essence of a chair. Now, before you write that off as double talk, um, I'll explain to you in just a minute what that means. Um, this at best, this chair is at best a copy of its ideal form. Uh, and this, the concept of the relationship between form and its material existence led to a lot of heresies in Christianity in the early church. So let me explain to you where these heresies and where Plato was going with this. Um, in the world of ideas, uh, which was the real world, the ultimate reality, The perfect of everything exists. To understand this view, let's, um, let's explore the following question. When I ask you to think about a chair, what idea um, comes to mind? If I had a way to communicate with everyone and I ask you to uh, tell me what you're thinking when I mention the word chair, there are all kinds of ideas that you could reply with. A wooden chair, a folding chair, a deck chair, um, an overstuffed lounger like my recliner, um, or perhaps a rocking chair that is unrelated to all of them. Um, these are but a few examples of the many variety of objects we call chairs. We all know it's a chair. This is um, Plato's theory of recollection, by the way. How do we know, or how would we define the common characteristics or the essence of a chair? How would we describe that? Um, you might say an object that we sit on, but that would be inadequate because we sit on a lot of different things um, that we don't call chairs. I sit on a tree stump in my backyard. That certainly is not a chair. It's a place to take a seat, to be sure, but it's not a chair. There's a difference between a chair, a sofa, a chair and a bench, um, a chair and a stool, we could say a chair has four legs, but some of them have fewer, um, some have more, and rocking chairs don't have any legs. Even Plato found it at times um, difficult to define things accurately. Um, in, as a side note, um, Plato was asked one time to describe or to provide a definition for what a man was, the essence of a man. And he came up with a featherless biped. Now, that may have made sense for a while. Maybe some people scoffed at him. Uh, I'm not sure. Nevertheless, um, at one point, a young man threw a plucked chicken over the wall into his courtyard and that pretty much brought an end to his calling himself a featherless biped. Um, anyway, Plato argued that in the ideal world, a, the perfect idea of a chair existed, or the perfect idea of the chairness existed. Now, where this comes into play 
is our soul comes from this ideal world so that we, when we are manifested in a human body, when our soul comes to exist through our mother and father in earthly birth or physical birth, everything is but a recollection of what we knew in the world of perfect ideas. We know what a chair is because we have remembrance of it. We know what a lamb is because we have a remembrance of it. From the world from which we came, the world of ideas. The knowledge is not obscured. Well, the knowledge is obscured or made dim, but not obliterated by the body. The body is the individual's or the soul's pr prison. The body is the cave in which our soul or mind is held captive. Everything we know or learn in our physical life, we are able to learn because we had a glim or the dim recollection of it from the ideal world. Um, actually, the ontological in philosophy, there is an argument for the existence of God called the ontological argument. And while Plato certainly didn't make the ontological argument, you can see um, where it could possibly fit here. What this means is, if the human mind can imagine a perfect being, then it must exist. Well, obviously I take exception with that, and you probably do too, but that's kind of what Plato was saying, that a perfect person, a perfect goat or cow or chair or table exist and we are taught, we are educated here on the planet, the physical reality, because people are able to draw out our recollections from the ideal world. And he said, he put it this way, um, in one of his dialogues, Socrates was able, he, and of course he uses Socrates as his protagonist, um, in one of his dialogues named Meno, um, Socrates is able to get an uneducated slave to lay out the Pythagorean theorem just by asking the correct questions and coaxing it out of his mind. Um, these, by the way, these dialogues are fascinating. If you ever have the inclination, um, I would really um, challenge you to read them. For, me, for Plato, knowledge comes not from experience, a posteri, but through reason, a priori. Ultimate ideas are innate and not discovered from experience. In other words, they are within us. They are within all of us. And we don't discover the truth of them by our experiences in the world, but by setting them free, so to speak, from our inner selves. The best senses can do is to awaken consciousness to what it already knows, according to Plato. At worst, the senses can mislead the mind. At best, it can provide recollection of what we already know. The true philosopher, according to Plato, cannot be satisfied with what we call today empirical information proof, facts, or sensory experience, which is not ideal knowledge, 
but again, is but a shadow of reality. This allows, well, this is the knowledge of opinion. Ever since the days of Plato, philosophers have never stopped wrestling with the ideas or the metaph met metaphysical status of ideas um, and the relationship between the formal or the essence of things and the physical or material. It's kind of like looking at the horizon and trying to determine just at what point on that horizon does the land end and the sky begin? At what point do our physical or um, sensual experiences reach into that other world and correlate to some sort of truth? Plato did everything he could to synthesize being and becoming. And I believe he went a long way to doing that. However, we can never really know, <laughs> at least not this side of the grave, whether there is an ultimate reality of ideas, uh, if that is really the um, realness of things. But Plato opened some doors um, that will be clarified as we go forward because everyone has probably heard of Plato's most famous student. And his name was Aristotle. And Aristotle becomes, as Christians, or whether Christians or not, as believers in one God, Aristotle becomes very important to us. So we have worked up to the position where we are now um, in philosophy with the birth of Aristotle. Now, in philosophy classes, if you've ever taken one, Aristotle, even today, is known as the philosopher. Uh, quite frankly, my personal opinion, and I'm only halfway joking about this, everything that needed to be said of a philosophical nature was said by Aristotle 2,000 years ago. Um, actually, 2,000 plus years ago. Everything else has been a rehashing of what he said. Um, Aristotle was born in 384 BC. Um, he was born in a uh, region of what we call Greece now, called Thrace. His father was the personal physician to the king of Macedonia. Um, and this becomes very important in Aristotle's development and the development of the Western world, um, as we'll see shortly. At 17, Aristotle went to Athens and joined Plato's school at the academy. Um, but what really has Aristotle stand out is he was a prolific writer and an indefatigable studier. 
he wrote on logic, rhetoric, poetry, ethics, biology, physics, um, astronomy, political theory, um, economics, a vast range of topic, uh, a top, uh, topics, uh, even anatomy and aesthetics. Um, Aristotle distinguished himself at Plato's school, and he studied there at the academy for 20 years. But it's interesting that there are two things that may have transpired during the 20 years that Aristotle was in Plato's school. Um, maybe both occurred. He alienated a lot of his fellow students because no one had the mind that Aristotle had. But not only that, there's a very good possibility that he alienated his teacher, Plato, because Plato didn't possess the mind that Aristotle had. And it's interesting, just kind of a side note, um, Aristotle was by far the uh, most accomplished alumni of the academy, yet when Plato died, and a uh, Plato was preparing to die, and he had to name a, uh, someone to take over his school, Aristotle was not his choice. Um, so one would think that there was some sort of conflict, um, and I'm, indeed I'm sure there was. Around 347, um, Aristotle left Athens and went to a place called Asos, A-S-S-O-S, which was near um, the city of Troy of Homer and the um, Iliad fame. He spent three years in the king's court in Asos um, and actually married the king's adoptive daughter. When Aristotle and his wife returned to Athens, she died, and he took up with a woman <clears throat> named Herophilus, or Herophilus, if you prefer, um, who bore him a son. <clears throat> uh, his name was Nicomachus. Uh, it's interesting that Aristotle never married this woman, and we'll see uh, as we go forward some oddities in their relationship. But in any event, in 342, Aristotle was summoned back to Macedonia. Uh, you may recall that his father was the uh, physician to the king. The king of Macedonia at this time was a gentleman named Philip. And many of you, or some of you, may recognize King Philip of Macedonia. Um, in any event, he called Aristotle, uh, his father was still the court physician, if I remember right, he called Aristotle back um, to Athens, or to Macedonia, to tutor his son, Alexander. Who eventually became known as the great. Aristotle was tutor to Alexander the Great. Um, Alexander, under um, Aristotle's tutelage, would not become a great philosopher, although he was well-educated, to be sure, but he would become known for his military acumen. Um, but one thing that Alexander got from Aristotle was a love of unification. And it was that that drove Alexander on his quest to unify the known world. He wanted to unify them under one culture, one language. Um, and ultimately, this became known That's Hellenization. And you may recall 
that is Alexander um, conquered all the way to the border of India and slightly beyond. He took Hellenization with him, which was the implementation of Greek culture, Greek language, onto the societies or the nations that he conquered. Um, he was also interested, which by the way stretched through Palestine and so forth as well, and touched um, on the Jews in Jerusalem, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and so forth. Um, Alexander was also interested in the acquisition of knowledge. Um, actually, Aristotle had remained behind, and all during um, Alexander's conquest, any time they ran across a strange species or something they didn't have be hadn't seen before, they sent it from wherever they were back to Aristotle. So Aristotle could study it and could learn from it and could catalog it. Some have said that um, this was the best funded government sponsored scientific ex uh, expedition in history because Alexander and the entire uh, Macedonian and after that Greek government was behind it. Um, in any event, Aristotle leaves Macedonia in 334 and returned to Athens and founded his own school. The Lyceum. The campus had uh, tree-covered walkways, um, and per uh, Aristotle would stroll along and teach as he was walking with his students following behind him, um, and therefore it was known as a peripatetic. school. Peripatetic being one who walks, a teacher that walks, just like Jesus did. We mentioned that um, the first week, I believe it was. The, me uh, the method of teaching while walking was later imitated by others, um, not to mention Jesus. And Aristotle pres presided over his school, the Lyceum, for 13 years. His Literary, literary, literary output was massive, and um, after Alexander the Great died in 323, um, a fierce anti-Macedonian mindset enveloped um, the Greek mind in uh, perhaps a lot of the con uh, conquered territory. But in any event, Aristotle was very closely linked to Alexander and his uh, father, Philip, so he was kind of caught um, in this uh, negative vibe, if you will, that was overtaking um, the Hellenized areas uh, upon Alexander's death. Um, like Socrates earlier, Aristotle was charged with impiety. Uh, he fled and about a, a year later, he died of natural causes. Now, I wanted to give you some background on Aristotle. Um, because Aristotle's father was part of the aristocracy. He mixed with kings. Aristotle mixed, mixed with kings and princes and the great. Um, so he was not a man that lacked experience. He was able to witness a great many things, and he had the leisure, thanks to Philip and um, Alexander, he had the leisure to study and develop his ideas. Next week, we're going to start talking about some of the things that uh, Aristotle um, arrived at, his philosophy, one of particular attention to us, and um, that is, is uh, he called the, um, the, the great unmoved mover, and I'll put that in plainer terms next week. And another lesser known um, 
philosopher that came to butt heads with Aristotle, um, who has probably taken over um, more of society's thought today than any seeker of truth um, like Aristotle. Um, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for um, these men that went before us that, that grasp after truth um, and wanted to know truth. Uh, to be sure, they had some different ideas and uh, they certainly um, were off a peg or two most of the time. Uh, but the, the hunger was real. The desire was real. And there was a great deal of, of discussion and teaching and education. And we're aware, Lord, that the only education that we really need is the, um, the knowledge um, of our sin and the um, need for it to be paid for and the fact that Jesus can do that for us. Um, nevertheless, um, the way we live today, the viewpoint of the vast majority of the world's population has to do with the thoughts and the ideas of what worst of the men that we are studying now. So be with us and help us to absorb, um, absorb this so that we understand um, who the enemy is, Lord, and who it is we are sent to witness to. Uh, bring us back next week and uh, bless us during the week to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night.